So here we're moving on to part two of Floriculture Nutrition, the latest in phosphorus fertility. And in part two, we will be looking at low phosphorus fertility effects on color enhancement. So again, this is a part of a three-part series. And in this part two, we'll talk about uh, color enhancement using low phosphorus to enhance the coloration of red and purple leaf plants. So red leaf color is a desirable trait found in several different ornamental species. Uh, zonal geraniums, alternanthera, irisene, coleus, these are all uh, species that are valued for their foliage, for the bright reds and purple colors uh, that these plants exhibit. And here you can see on the bottom, you've got two tomato leaves, the plant on the left being green and healthy, and the plant on the right uh, being phosphorus deficient, having that nice dark purple coloration. So part of what we wanted to see here is if we could use low phosphorus to enhance the red pigmentation without negative effects on growth. So what does phosphorus nutrition have to do with coloration? Phosphorus deficiency increases red leaf pigmentation, as we just mentioned, and this is due to an increase in anthocyanins and beta cyanins. So you can see the structure of these molecules here, but these are, these are two of the major uh, leaf pigments that cause those nice red and purple colors that you see in ornamental plants. And anthocyanins are, are one of the most commonly found red pigments found in plants, and they're found in plants such as zonal geraniums, coleus, and uh, red leaf lettuce, for instance. Um, and the relationship between anthocyanin enhancement and phosphorus nutrition has been well established. It's been known for many decades that low phosphorus leads to enhanced anthocyanin production. Beta cyanins, however, are a less common red pigment that are found in uh, mainly amaranth species, such as alternanthera, and some other species, such as carnations. And uh, the relationship between beta cyanins and phosphorus nutrition has not previously been established uh, until uh, some of my studies that we'll discuss here. Additionally, one third pigment to consider is chlorophyll. Hopefully you all know chlorophyll being the green pigment uh, that is responsible for photosynthesis and uh, helps our industry to grow. Um, so low phosphorus stress limits chlorophyll production. Um, so you see the effects on coloration where low phosphorus increases those red pigments and it decreases uh, the green pigments like chlorophyll. So we saw that several plant pigments are affected by phosphorus nutrition, and these pigments determine what the color of the plant looks like to us. And of course, color is a very significant driver of consumer preferences, as we always say color sells, so uh, that's what we wanted to look at in these studies. So our research question was, can low phosphorus fertilization enhance foliar coloration in red leaf species? And you can see uh, this kind of range of red coloration in the leaves of this alternate uh, thera leaves on the screen right here. So uh, I'm gonna walk you through a couple of different experiments that we did, starting with this first experiment. We grew alternate thera plants with phosphorus rates of zero to 20 parts per million. And uh, after four weeks, half of the plants were switched to zero parts per million, and the other half remained on their initial uh, rate of phosphorus. At the end of the experiments, we measured the growth and color parameters. We measured the growth index by measuring the height, diameter, and dry mass. Uh, we measured the chlorophyll levels using a SPAD meter, such as the one that you see on the screen. We measured color uh, by doing color ratings with a colorometer. And we also looked at the actual beta cyanin concentrations in the leaves. And here you can see this first cultivar that we worked with was uh, Purple Prince Alternanthera. You can see the plants in the top row were grown with constant phosphorus, while the plants on the bottom row were those that were grown with an initial rate of phosphorus and then switched to zero parts per million phosphorus. So here, the main trends I wanna show you are that the plants that were grown with zero parts per million phosphorus or two and a half parts per million phosphorus were significantly stunted, as we saw in some of the previous studies. Uh, however, they were also much darker in coloration, so we did see this increase in pigmentation. And then if you look at the plants on the right, the ones that were grown with constant 20 parts per million or 20 parts per million switched to zero, you can see that they're much more lush, and especially the top right-hand corner, the plant that was grown with a constant rate of 20 parts per million, uh, 
you can see that this plant uh, there was definitely exhibiting more of those green pigments than uh, many of the other plants grown in this study. So looking at the chlorophyll levels in these plants, we saw, uh, well, first off, I just wanna show you the graph. It's the relative chlorophyll levels on the y-axis and the phosphorus rate on the x-axis. And uh, you can see the dotted bars represent plants that receive a constant rate of phosphorus. And the bars with diagonal lines, uh, those are plants that were grown with an initial rate of phosphorus that was then restricted to zero parts per million. And basically what this graph is showing is that the higher values those are higher levels of chlorophyll, which correspond to a more green plant. And then the lower values are those that have less chlorophyll. And when there's less of that green pigmentation, there's gonna be more of that red pigmentation dominating uh, what we actually see. So you can see that the bar on the far left, representing plants that were grown without any phosphorus for the entire study, you can see that they had significantly lower chlorophyll levels than any of the plants that were grown with a constant continuous rate of phosphorus. And you can also see that plants that were grown with two and a half, five, and 10 parts per million phosphorus, but then restricted to zero parts per million, had significantly lower levels of chlorophyll as well. And uh, one of the mo more important things that I wanna show you here is that there actually weren't any significant differences between plants that were grown with 20 parts per million continuously and 20 parts per million restricted to zero. So that indicates there that 20 parts per million, even though they were restricted to zero for four weeks, that uh, that was still enough phosphorus in, in their system to uh, maintain the same levels of chlorophyll. And uh, this can be explained by that luxury consumption of phosphorus that you see plants, when you give them excess levels of phosphorus, they will have greater stores in the foliage and therefore they'll be able to pull from those stores when uh, phosphorus is limited. And thus you don't see those effects of phosphorus deficiency come on quite as quickly. Now, what I think was more interesting was the actual beta cyanin concentrations because uh, the beta cyanin is, is what's actually responsible for that red coloration, regardless of how much chlorophyll there was. So <clears throat> again, this graph is set up in a very similar way where uh, beta cyanin concentration is on the y-axis and phosphorus rate is on the x-axis. Uh, but this kind of works inverse to the last graph we just saw where lower values are going to be plants with less beta cyanin and therefore would be more green and then plants that, uh, or bars that are higher, values that are higher, are gonna be those plants that have higher beta cyanin values and are going to appear more red. And what I wanted to show you is this interesting trend. If you look at the, the bars that, were, uh, that are dotted, you can see this downward trend from zero to 20 parts per million, where uh, the level of beta cyanin actually just goes down uh, with every increase rate of phosphorus. However, if you look at the restricted bars, you can see that they actually follow an initial upward trend and peak at 10 parts per million initially, then restricted to zero. So you can see that circled, uh, these two bars circled, you can see there's a big difference, the low bar being plants that were grown with a constant rate of phosphorus, and the, the uh, higher bar with the diagonal lines is the plant that was grown with 10 parts per million initially, and then restricted to zero. And so we saw there was this huge difference in uh, beta cyanin concentrations between these two plants. And what we hypothesize is that due to this sudden limitation of growth brought on by uh, phosphorus deficient conditions, you had this sudden uh, accumulation of excess metabolites. And usually those metabolites would be used to go toward primary growth, just you know, getting taller, you know, branching out more. Um, but since phosphorus was limited, it actually changed the use of those metabolites and ended up putting them into pigment production. And then again, as we saw with chlorophyll, uh, the plants that were grown with 20 continuously or 20 parts per million phosphorus restricted had similar levels of beta cyanin, uh, indicating that um, that was still enough phosphorus in the plant system to uh, maintain its, its current uh, level, natural level of beta cyanin production current, uh, natural level of chlorophyll production. So we saw some really interesting trends there that phosphorus deficiency definitely did increase beta cyanins, increase the red coloration, 
So we went ahead and did another uh, couple of experiments with alternate thera. We grew a couple of different cultivars with, again, rates of zero to 20 parts per million phosphorus. Some of the plants were switched to zero parts per million phosphorus after four weeks, and some of the plants were switched to two and a half parts per million phosphorus after four weeks. So we wanted to see if we could go all, all the way without phosphorus and also if we could uh, go to a very low level but not completely restrict phosphorus. And then again, at the end of the study, we measured several different growth and color parameters, such as growth index, chlorophyll levels, color ratings, and then we also looked at the beta cyanin concentrations. Here you can see Brazilian red hots. Um, you can see the initial rate of phosphorus on the bottom, ranging from zero to 20 parts per million. And then you can see the final rate of phosphorus on the left side there. So starting from the top and working our way down, you can see that the plants in the top row were uh, grown with the same continuous rate of phosphorus for the entire study, being 5, 10, and 20 parts per million phosphorus. Next, we see uh, in the row below that, that these were plants grown with an initial rate of 2.5 to 20 parts per million, but they ended the experiment with 2.5 parts per million. And lastly, on the bottom row, you can see these were plants grown with 0 to 20 parts per million phosphorus, and then restricted to zero halfway through production. And you can see that it, it provides this really nice gradient from the bottom left corner where you have the most stunting but also the deepest red coloration to the upper right hand corner where you have uh, definitely a lot of excess growth um, and, and more of those green pigments. So this shows that you know there's somewhere in the middle that you can achieve a nice dark uh, purple coloration, dark purple or red coloration, without uh, restricting growth too heavily. And so uh, you can see that by using an initial rate uh, of five parts per million and using that as a constant rate throughout the entire production cycle, or by uh, growing a plant with five parts per million initially and then switching it to two and a half parts per million, you can get that nice deep uh, coloration without uh, too much stunting and growth. Additionally, with plants that were grown with 10 parts per million phosphorus initially and then switched to two and a half or zero parts per million phosphorus, you can see that those plants also were kind of in that, that realm of uh, nice darker coloration without any negative side effects. So that's kind of the area that you'd want to aim for this cultivar. And again, just looking uh, specifically at the individual leaves, these would be the most recently matured leaves that we uh, sampled off the plants. And here again, you can see that plants that were not switched, that remained on a constant rate of phosphorus of five parts per million, and those that were started with 10 parts per million phosphorus and switched to zero, those are the plants that are going to have the uh, best and deepest coloration without the negative uh, reduction in size and limitation of growth. Here you can see is another cultivar of alternate thera we worked with. This one is Little Ruby, and this slide is set up exactly the same way as the, the one that we just previously looked at. Um, and you can see, again, this nice color gradient where the plants at the lower left-hand corner are much darker, but also much more stunted and compact. And the plants in the top right-hand corner are uh, much more lush and also much more green. And uh, we saw here that just like with Brazilian red hots, uh, plants that were grown with five parts per million for the entire study, or five parts per million, then switched to two and a half, or plants that were grown with 10 parts per million and switched to two and a half or zero parts per million, uh, these are the plants that are going to have the nicest color without those detrimental effects on growth. So uh, it appears that for both of these alternate thera cultivars, that that is kind of the treatment that you'd want to go with. And this makes sense because we saw that growth was optimized with about five to 10 parts per million phosphorus. So by getting plants up to size with that five to 10 part per million range and then restricting phosphorus, you get the plants to, to their saleable uh, mature size at, without any detrimental effects on growth. And then you induce a very, very slight phosphorus deficiency at the end that just kicks up those anthocyanins or beta cyanins, depending on what species you're looking at. So uh, again, my range here for recommendations uh, is about five to 10 parts per million. Moving on to another experiment, uh, here in experiment three, we looked at zonal geraniums that were grown with rates of zero to 20 parts per million phosphorus. Uh, 
Half of the plants were switched to two and a half parts per million after six weeks, while the other half remained on their initial rate, similar to what we saw in these previous studies. And at the end of the studies, we measured growth and color parameters. We measured growth index again, uh, chlorophyll levels, and we did color ratings again. And uh, here, I just wanted to show you, there was more of an effect, uh, just plants that were grown uh, with each constant level uh, of phosphorus. And so you can see there was a definite effect on the purple or red coloration of those leaves when grown at lower phosphorus rates. You can see that the plant that was grown without phosphorus was extremely stunted and had definitely some negative side effects of phosphorus deficiency. The plant that was grown with two and a half parts per million phosphorus had a nice deep uh, red and a very defined zone uh, coloration on those leaves, but unfortunately it was a little bit uh, stunted and did have a delay in flowering. And it wasn't until you got up into that five to 20 part per million range that you uh, didn't have any detrimental effects due to phosphorus deficiency. Um, but again, the leaves weren't quite as dark and the zones weren't quite as defined. But from the color meter readings that we did, we saw that plants that were grown with a constant rate of five parts per million uh, phosphorus were actually significantly redder than the plants that were grown with 10 or 20 parts per million phosphorus. So yes, you do get deeper and darker colorations with zero to two and a half parts per million phosphorus, but unfortunately, you just don't have the growth that you need to market a saleable plant. So uh, again, this is one that I would have to recommend somewhere in the range of about five parts per million to uh, control growth maybe to some extent, but also to kind of enhance that red coloration in the plant. And lastly, just really quickly, I wanted to move on from kind of a floriculture to more of an edible crop. Uh, in experiment four, we grew red leaf lettuce with rates of zero to 20 parts per million phosphorus. Half of the plants were switched to zero after three weeks and then grown for an additional three weeks uh, after that. And again, at the end of the study, we measured the growth and color parameters, such as the growth index, the chlorophyll levels, and we did color ratings again. And here you can see the Salanova red lettuce, a very, uh, very defined uh, response to phosphorus here. You can see the top row being plants that were grown with a constant rate of phosphorus and the bottom row being plants that were switched to zero. And of course, you can see here that the plants that were grown with 20 parts per million constantly, the plant at the top right, was definitely much larger than any of the other plants grown in this study. And this may indicate that certain plant edible species, such as lettuce, may have a higher phosphorus requirement than some of the ornamental species that we grow. Uh, so it's very quick growing, vigorous growing uh, plant like lettuce, it may have a high phosphorus requirement. And you can see that by limiting phosphorus down just to 10 parts per million, you did uh, have a, a pretty significant reduction in size, uh, but you do have a little bit darker of a red coloration. But then by going down to five, you had this really deep purple coloration uh, that was present on the plants, although they were quite stunted. But if you look at the plants that were grown with 20 parts per million and then switch to zero, you can see that it still got to a very large size that would most likely be considered a, a saleable, uh, marketable plant. Uh, however, it was much darker and uh, redder or more purple in coloration compared to the plant that was grown with 20 parts per million continuously. So you definitely can use your phosphorus fertilization to change the color of, uh, of a red leaf lettuce crop, such as, as this Salanova red. And uh, in conclusion for part two, uh, we saw that low phosphorus fertilization resulted in significantly redder plants, and this is due to increased red pigments, uh, such as anthocyanins and beta cyanins. And what we found from these studies and what we would recommend is that you first size up the plants with a rate of five to 10 parts per million phosphorus, then lower the phosphorus fertilization rate just for the last couple of weeks to enhance that red coloration. And otherwise, if you go too low or you grow with too low of a phosphorus rate for the entire study, you're going to have significant stunting, delayed flowering, or necrosis of the lower leaves, which will all, of course, uh, make the plant unmarketable. So you first need to size up those plants with a low but adequate rate of phosphorus before you were to implement a, one of those very, very low uh, phosphorus fertilizer regimens.
And if you are interested in learning some more uh, about this topic, you can check out our article in the August 2017 edition of Grower Talks magazine, Seeing More Red. So in this article, we again discuss uh, using low phosphorus to enhance the red coloration of certain crops. So please go ahead and check that out. Uh, it's online or in print. So uh, yeah, if you're interested, please uh, take a look at that article. And with that, I uh, will conclude part two and open it up to any questions.